In Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2, the Apostle writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Renew your mind. That's the theme that this congregation has set before itself this year. And what I want to think about with you this morning is one of the threats to our renewal of the mind. I'd like for us to think about a way that this world has of viewing their existence, their aims, and their goals in life that we are tempted sometimes to conform to but rather we want to think about the renewal and breaking out of that mindset. And that mindset is summed up in this phrase, I just want to be happy. I just want to be happy. It is rare that you meet or come across someone that doesn't have that as their individual mission statement and goal and aim and conclusion in their existence. I just want to be happy. It's true for unbeliever and it's true for believer as well. When a particular lifestyle or a behavior or any kind of attitude is identified as sin according to the Bible or lying outside the scope of what is authorized in the Bible, often the ready defense that we hear is, well, I just want to be happy and God wants me to be happy. And so who are you then to question and to criticize me for pursuing what is the ultimate good and that is my happiness? It's not just unbeliever, by the way, who has that mindset. I think believers often have that too. And I think it is most clearly seen when a believer has this mindset of, I just want to be happy above all else. You can most often hear that coming through loud and clear when we talk about heaven. Heaven is a place that I want to go to where I'm not going to hurt anymore. I'll be back with my family and my friends and the people I've respected in the past. I'll never die again. No evil, no pain, no passage of time that will corrupt. And heaven is going to be a nice place where I will rest. And if that is our mindset toward heaven, ultimately, we join the throngs and the masses of mankind who say, I just want to be happy. This claim that I just want to be happy on the surface seems quite reasonable. And it seems quite attractive to us. God is good, happiness is a good, and so God gives me what makes me happy, or he permits me to pursue what makes me happy, and so I just want to be happy, leave me alone. You know, from this argument and this statement and this series of claims that seem so reasonable and attractive, there's one premise that is never stated. There is one bit of the argument that the the whole thing needs in order to be completed, but we never say it out loud, and we often don't think about it consciously, but the missing premise is when we say God's good, happiness is good, so God wants me to be happy, what is unstated is the assumption that I am the sole and final judge of what makes me happy. The Bible says otherwise. For anyone who has read just a sentence of the Bible, we begin to realize that I am fatally unprepared to be the final judge of what makes me happy. Look at Adam and Eve. What made them happy in the garden? They misidentified that. When uh, Esau comes in into the tent of Jacob and he sees the stew, He says, let me have some of that red, red stuff. I'm about to die of hunger. It's going to cost you your birthright. Fine, I'll, I'll, I'll give it. Just give me some of that soup. We are so woefully inadequate at judging at what true happiness is. For anyone who has an ounce of desire to have any relationship with God, it is clear from Scripture that God is the one who knows what is in our best interests. And in our best interest is not happiness, but actually holiness. And that is the title, and that is the focus of our study this morning. 
renew your mind, happiness or holiness. In this lesson, I want to look at just three different pivot points or watershed moments where I have to decide I'm either going to pursue my happiness or I'm going to pursue holiness. And after we've looked at these three different points, we want to conclude our lesson. And the primary thrust of our lesson will be taken from 1 Peter. You might be turning over to 1 Peter chapter 2, although we will look at some other scriptures in the course of our study. We'll begin, as I said, in 1 Peter chapter 2. And the first inflection point or the first crisis of decision comes in indulgence, self-indulgence, or self-denial. I'm either going to indulge myself in the pursuit of happiness or I will deny myself in the pursuit of holiness. The Apostle Peter writes in chapter 2 of his first letter in verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Look at how the apostle establishes your identity and mine in this verse. As a child of God, I don't belong in this world, so why would I expect to find happiness and fulfillment in this world? I don't belong here, and I'm not going to stay here. So why would I anchor my happiness in the things of this life? And yet so many do. The apostle says, no, your identity is that of a sojourner. You are a passerby. And there are lusts that war against your soul. I have to decide, will I indulge self or will I seek holiness? Turn over to chapter 4. In chapter 4, we see some of the specific lusts that war against us. Specific activities and behaviors that promise happiness and yet yield nothing like it. In chapter 4, in verse 3, we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. You look at the world around us, and these are often the things that people will look to to find happiness in. And they will find happiness in what they deem as judging their own sexual fulfillment, or trying to drown out their worries and to blind themselves to the unhappiness of life by alcohol. And it amazes me the people that think that through a physical intimacy of a relationship or through a click on the computer or in the bottom of a bottle, they're going to find happiness. And when we question them, they say, I'm, just leave me alone, I want to be happy. No, you don't know what you want. God wants you to be holy. And what we find in the writings of Peter is there is no expectation in any of these letters that happiness is going to be something that the children of God find in this life. Except it's persecution and difficulty. But holiness is the fruit if we endure that. Turn also with me over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. First, uh, sorry, chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What we find here is a rejection of one area in which people seek self-indulgence, whereas on the other hand, God tells us what it is that He called us to and what He wants for us. In 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 1, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Pause. Sanctification is just another word that is synonymous with holiness. Sanctification is holyification. It is the process by, what, by which God makes us holy. And so this is God's will, your sanctification, not your happiness. Go on in verse 3. That you should abstain from sexual immorality. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. 
Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. There are a world of people that think that in self-indulgence and in sexual fulfillment, they are going to find happiness. And whenever people are criticized, you do not belong in a relationship with that person. They are someone who is bringing you down spiritually. They are encouraging you and they have persuaded you to engage in activities with them that are not lawful in God's eyes. You have no right to be married to this person. They don't have a right to be married. You don't have a right to be married and yet you're married to them. And often the response is, I'm happy. They make me happy. He or she fulfills me. That is not what God called you to. God is not so much concerned with your happiness, but with your holiness. Show me the scripture that states that God wants you to be happy above all else. God wants you to be holy above all else. But that's not the only area that we have to fight this. It's not just in the matter of self-indulgence or self-denial, but a second area that determines whether we're going to pursue happiness or holiness is in the matter of whether I will choose ease at every cost or whether I will endure with patience at any cost. I'd like to introduce this thought in this way. It occurs to me that sometimes, even as children of God, we can find that I have actually been asking God all along for me to be happy more than I have been requesting and petitioning Him to make me holy. Can I give an example of that? I can go through my day and I wake up in the morning and I ask God, Lord, keep me and my loved ones safe today. If I'm going to be going on a trip, I will pray that I will arrive safely. I will pray that God takes care of my loved ones in the day. I find that a loved one has an illness, a health issue. I pray the Lord to take care of it. I pray that the Lord would keep me healthy in mind and body. I have a loved one, perhaps, who is in need of care. I pray for them. I pray that a pregnancy will be uncomplicated. I pray that a child would have no disabilities. I pray that the job interview goes well and that I get the job. I pray that my financial aims will come to fruition. I pray for this and for that, and if I'm not careful, I realize that what I have prayed for ultimately is that God encase me in bubble wrap, and I never have to be ill at ease or face the problems of life. Are all of those things appropriate to pray for? Yes, I pray for them. And I find in Scripture that the approved servants of God prayed for these kinds of things. But Christian, be aware that if I set my sole focus and goal on getting through life unscathed, and my prayers consist of God only making me at ease, I have missed the point. And I ultimately, I'm afraid I'm seeking happiness and not holiness. Maybe we could add on to these prayers as so many of you do. Lord, I pray that my loved ones would be safe, but if not, may they be spiritually safe in you, regardless. Lord, restore my health, but if not, renew me in the inner man day by day. Lord, if I am denied this opportunity or this financial windfall or this career movement, Lord, help me to be humble and to do the best wherever I am. We can, in the course of praying for these good things and bringing our anxieties to God, we need not forget the ultimate goal is not that God would wrap me in His spiritual bubble wrap all throughout life, but that I be holy. Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 1. Look in 1 Peter chapter 1. I 
If you'll notice verse 4, we're starting kind of in the middle of the sentence, but that's okay. In 1 Peter 1 and verse 4, we are called to an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and that it's not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now notice especially verse 6 here. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What this passage tells me is that there will be undeniably times in my life when God will allow me to be unhappy. But it is in the unhappiness and the pain and in the suffering that holiness is perfected. Look over with me to James. Back a few pages to James chapter 1. In James 1 and in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And so we find that it is here that in the enduring of suffering, enduring of the pain, facing disappointments, and letting God work on us in those times where He makes me more patient, more empathetic, more compassionate, more servant-minded, more humble, looking heavenward. In all of these times, He is crafting me to be holy. A third and a final area in which I have to make the decision whether I'm going to pursue happiness or holiness is in the matter of of whether I will take on and own my own self-destiny or whether I will choose to be a partaker of the divine nature. This world would pawn off to us. You need to have the mindset, you're in charge of your life. You need to decide who you are. You select your identity. And you need to seek your own self-actualization, your own fulfillment. Decide who you are, what you want. Don't let anyone get in your way. Let your own inner light shine. The Bible says you are actually to let another light shine within you. And that is of Christ. The Bible doesn't call us to be the best versions of ourselves and to seek that above all else. The best version of myself is the reason Christ went to the cross. I'm wanting more than that. God calls me to more to that. He calls me to be like His Son. Look over to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in His steps. I am to take, in a sense, the identity of Christ in His character. And so much so that the Apostle Paul would write in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. And there the operative word is I. I have been crucified with Christ. Ego, self. And so, it is not I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Look also in that sense over to chapter 3 of 1 Peter and verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that He might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And so again, the lesson here is Christian. Christ suffered. Christ endured and accepted, in a way that none of us can, the extreme unhappiness. Why? To bring us to God. To bring us to God happy but unholy? No, to bring us to Him holy at any expense. 
And look on then to chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. It's holiness he has called us to. Christian, renew your mind in that way. And finally on this, look in chapter 5 and verse 10. But may the God of all grace, who has called us to His eternal happiness and bliss. No, you, you did not read it that way. Who called us to His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. That is what God has called us to. But I would be so remiss if I left it just at that. In the end, as we begin to conclude our lesson this morning, the choice is not actually between happiness and holiness. It's not. It's a false choice. Holiness results in the ultimate and true happiness as the creature defers to the Creator and to His wisdom and His discipline and His design for us. I want to close by going over to 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going to read a little bit further with you. We left off in verse 7, didn't we? We want to pick up then in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. And as we read at the end of verse 7, we read about Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that Not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. Renew your mind. It's not happiness that you seek. It is holiness. And one thing that I've begun to realize in my life is that all the times in my past that I've gone to the house of happiness and I've knocked on her door and I've knocked and knocked at the door of happiness, you know what I've found? I never find her at home. She's never there. She never answers. But instead, when I've gone to the house of God... I found that happiness is a very frequent guest there. If you're not a Christian, you may be from time to time in your life happy. You will also be from time to time in your life miserable. And what you need to realize is that it cannot be that the story of your existence is just riding the waves of happiness and misery. God calls you to holiness, to be a partaker of His divine nature. And that begins by surrendering yourself entirely and thoroughly and forever to Jesus Christ, the Holy One of God. Obey Him and seek Him in His way. Believe on Him with all your heart and confess Him before men and He will confess you before His Father. Repent of your former lusts and your former aimless life and be immersed in water, baptized for the remission of your sins and you will be sanctified and fit for the Master's use. And if in any way, Christian, 
We as an assembly this morning can encourage you in prayer and lifting your name up before the throne of God. We wish for you to make that known. If you wish for that or wish to become a Christian this morning, and if we can assist you, come forward while we stand and while we sing for you.